So today we're going to be talking to some career changers who have made the transition into instructional design. So we've got corporate, freelance, higher ed. So we've got a really good um, rounded out experience group here that you can learn from. Hello, everyone. Hi. Thank you so much. I just want to kick it off with saying thank you for spending your time with us this afternoon and making space um, and to share your experiences. So thank you very much for being here. So what I would like to do, if it is okay with each of you, I want to kick it off with you introducing who you are, what your previous um, profession was, and then what kind of space are you working in? I know that some of you are working in kind of a dual space. So just tell us, like, are you a freelancer, corporate instructional design, higher ed, pursuing a job? Like, just give us the rundown of who you are, where you started, and where you're working at or what you're working towards. So Katie, you want to kick us off? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I'm Katie and I was a teacher for 10 years in the classroom. So I taught high school uh, social studies, so uh, American history and government, sometimes computers. And then I decided to kind of switch gears and I uh, became an instructional designer. So I spent a lot of my first professional career in um, ID working for an organization. So in the corporate uh, corporate world. And now I work for the instructional design company. With Shantae. <laughs> but before that, before you worked with me, can you tell us a little bit about what you were doing? Like when yeah. you made that transition, where where did you start your ID role? So I, I started as a, a, a training specialist. And so we would create trainings in for that organization. Um, and then I moved into more sort of like a corporate trainer sort of role. So I would deliver and facilitate uh, manager leadership training for both team members and managers within that organization. So you'd have learning paths and I would facilitate as well as kind of build things for the organization uh, for some departments or just for like the HR departments really where I was housed um, to be able to build and, and facilitate those trainings for the entire organization. So that's kind of what I was doing before. And, and um, my transition to that was like trying to get into use my experience um, and be able to still use all of those things, use all of the, my expertise from the classroom, but also to not be um, a poor teacher anymore and also <laughs> be able to uh, just just learn more and do more stuff. And so I, I get to check all of those boxes uh, with ID. So I'm really glad about that. Awesome. Thank yeah. you, Katie. How about you, Sarah? Um, Sarah, and um, I was also a teacher for 10 years. Um, I taught middle school French, um, and this is my first year full-time freelance instructional design. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Darlene? Hi, everyone. I'm Darlene. I was on the corporate side for many years. Um, I was working with a large insurance company, and I was actually doing um, working on their education team, but doing the the up close and personal with the agents where I was doing the training and the facilitating um, the consulting with them. And then all of a sudden, just out of the blue, Allstate decided that, you know what, we really need to have a um, have an actual design team. So I had applied for the role. They called it the education development specialist, but that's just the fancy term for an instructional designer at Allstate. So I had applied for that and earned the right to sit in the seat. So I was super excited to be there. And um, unfortunately, though, all good things must come to an end. So as of this time last year, actually, they had done a restructure of the team and my role was eliminated. So unfortunately, then it was total shocker. Didn't really know what I was going to do. Gave it some thought. Thought, you know what? How hard can it be? So I actually opened my own design company and I've been working on that on the side. Um, and yeah, so it's been exciting. That's awesome. Thank you, darling. And how about you, Joni? Well, I was also a teacher and then um, for about 15 years, language arts, reading, and then I had an opportunity to leave the classroom and work for some ed tech companies. So what I realized um, last year when I started looking into instructional design is for the last nine years, I've really been just following the Addy model 
and developing content um, to help teachers and administrators and, and students learn how to use the this instructional software that I was working with these companies on. So that's kind of how I started my transition, um, building out content, delivering it, but I was also doing the face-to-face -face training on it. I was doing the data analysis on it. I was meeting with the stakeholders and going over the data because it was a business and if the data looks good, then they're going to rebuy and then I get a bonus. So, <laughs> I <really like> that. <laughs> so bonuses here I are good. We want bonuses. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's always good to have the money, but all in all, I was, uh, I found out last year that I was already doing instructional design. I just needed to learn the, the terminology and some of the really cool tech items that we have now to develop this um, content. Awesome. So Joni, what spaces are you working in related to instructional design? Yeah, I'm working with the higher ed right now. So I'm working with um, subject matter experts. Some may be a professor, some might just be someone who's an expert in their area. And they, I'm working with them to write content for a college and to put their instruction online. Awesome, awesome, thank you. All right, so my next question, I'm going to direct it, Sarah. So Sarah, I would love it if you would share with us what your transition from the classroom into full-time freelance has been. So how did you go from 10 years in the classroom to working for yourself? So it was kind of a slow journey for me. I honestly started out uh, with instructional design. Just I decided if you're a teacher, you know, you're kind of expected to get your master's degree. Um, and the traditional master's degrees for teachers really weren't very exciting. I wasn't excited about the programs and I couldn't see them being used elsewhere. And even though I had no plans to leave teaching, I kind of wanted to do something that could be useful elsewhere if I ever needed an exit plan. Um, so I got my master's in instructional design um, online and then honestly didn't think about instructional design for like two years. Um, I uh, had and I was surprised that I'd never heard of instructional design before um, when I was teaching because it seemed like such a perfect fit. I honestly, um, just by chance, I saw somebody on LinkedIn that had the title instructional designer around the same time I was trying to figure out what to get my master's in. And so it kind of aligned. I was like, why don't more teachers know about this? Like, it seems like such a natural path. Um, so I got that. I took care of the, the degree. I didn't think about instructional design for two years. And then I had what I thought was the worst year ever. Um, it was 2019. So things 2020 really put things into perspective. I was a little bit early, but it was just a really stressful year for me. And it was stressful with things that were kind of outside of my control. It wasn't like um, if I just get more organized or if I just work a little bit harder in my, in my teaching job, um, I can turn things around. It was all kind of outside factors. Um, so I was towards the end of the year. I started looking at instructional design jobs. I polished off my resume. I put together a really sad portfolio with um, just like stuff I thought looked good that I had created as a teacher. And I applied for so many jobs in every, uh, every genre, uh, corporate jobs. I applied for higher ed and I started uh, bidding on jobs on Upwork. Um, I did actually get an offer for higher ed that I turned down because it wasn't the right fit for me. Um, but I got my first uh, project on Upwork actually with a, um, a like a startup and uh, e-learning company. And it was a really, it turned into a really good opportunity. Um, what I ended up doing with my teaching job was I was able to um, resign from part of my teaching job. I traveled between multiple schools. So I quit one school. I kept working part-time. So I kind of kept one foot in teaching. I did a lot of instructional design work on the side. And then I just got to the point where I was putting enough hours in on the instructional design side that I was able to make the choice. Like, do I want to stay here? Do I want to go? I stayed through COVID teaching. I, I, my husband said, are you sure you want to do this? Like you could just leave teaching now. And I said, no, I have to do it. Like I want to be there for the kids this year. And then at the end of the year, I was like, All right, I'm out. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> and so you're full time right now in freelancing. Yes. Awesome. I, I was part time for two years. I was still teaching part time and picking up jobs, uh, instructional design jobs part time. And now I'm all in on instructional design. 
Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. All right. So what I want to do now is just like have each of you if, just kind of explain like, so if you're corporate or you're higher ed or you're freelance, what is kind of like the, the day of, you know, a day in the life of, so you get up in the morning, like what does that day look like for you in the role that you're in? All right. So how about we start with you, Joni? Well, um, in the higher ed environment, we pretty much day one, I am introduced to the subject matter expert who I'm going to be working with. We kind of go over our template and then I take on the role as project manager. So um, thank you, Katie and Shante have kind of mentored me in this a little bit here. And I have a template that I use as like my own checklist. So I know what to do each week in that project management role. And I work with the subject matter expert to fill in content into a template. So we meet once a week, sometimes more if necessary. And um, we just go through the checklist. We are setting up learning objectives for an entire course. We are evaluating those learning objectives. And um, what I found is even if someone says they know Bloom's taxonomy and know how to write the learning objectives, don't always take them for their word because they don't, they, they might know the first two levels. So it is our job to coach them through writing higher level thinking objectives for these um, courses and then guide them step by step. Um, one of the things that I have found, and I don't know if I'm jumping ahead or not, but I've had to really take a inside look at my own communication style and step back and, and, not always that it's not always that I'm typing on eggshells, but I have to really watch how I phrase different things that I say so that I don't offend somebody um, or make them feel like what they're doing is wrong. So just know that when you're working with a subject matter expert, they they know their field. We know ours and sometimes communicating um, the differences is not always an easy thing to do. So really day in, day out, I'm communicating, I'm project managing, and I'm guiding and advising. Awesome, awesome, thank you for sharing that. And I, I just wanna highlight something that Joni um, called out here. So as instructional designers, we know the best practices. Like if you take our advice, we're going to show you how to build the most incredible learning experience. But what happens in the real world is like we have this vision, we have this knowledge, we have this expertise. And then when we go to work with someone who is an expert in the content, but not in how to design amazing learning experiences, it's like we're operating up here, they're operating down here. And it's a very hard push to get them all the way up here. So what we have to do is incrementally, oh, this is all you got this time? Great, we're gonna take you there and it's gonna be better than had we not been involved. And then the next time we work with them, maybe we get them here, right? So we're incrementally building that skill and that muscle with them, which means that in the meantime, we are flexing. We are flexing in a way that maybe even our fingernails cringe a little bit, like they're on the chalkboard because we're like, oh yeah, no, not. Not great, but hey, we're going to go with that. So I think it's really good to call that out. So thank you, Joni. All right. How about for you, Darlene? Like a day in the life. Um, so I'll give you a view of the corporate world because that's where the the bulk of my uh, my experience so far has been. So when I worked with Allstate, I think day one looks like very similar to what Joni was saying is you'll get a, for me, you have, um, it's super, super fast paced. It's extremely tight deadlines and multitasking is your number one, even though no one really does multitasking well, you've got to learn to really juggle and prioritize big time. Um, it's not uncommon to be working on more than one project at a time. They could be multiple projects and they could be huge projects. Like we're rewriting our whole entire policy processing software and it's gonna be a new program. So it could be something like that. Um, so the day could start out with, um, you could actually from your manager, I would be assigned a project. Um, the project request would all come into her through a form and 
we really nailed that down and got that well presented because at first it was just like, oh, well, they know Darlene and I've been with Allstate for 20 years plus. So everyone was just picking up the phone and calling me and me being me, I'm just like working on the project. So it's like, no, it doesn't work that way. It's got to be a little bit more streamlined. Um, so then we worked it out. The project would come into the manager. She would assign an instructional designer to it. Um, very similar to Joni. You'd work with the subject matter experts you would follow through through Addy, but what led me to Shantae's um, accelerator class was I felt that when I had left Allstate that I really didn't know like all of the ins and outs of the adult theories and the principles um, because I was corporate world and now I was striking out on my own. So I just wanted to kind of fill any gaps that I felt were maybe missing. Um, so hence I, I went forward with Shantae's accelerator class and that really, really helped me to cement what I already knew, but also fill in some of those gaps too. Um, because in the corporate world, storyboarding may look differently because everything is so extreme fast paced. Maybe it's not a PowerPoint, maybe it's not a Word document, maybe it's actually a mock-up of what the course could look like. So once it's been determined through working with your SMEs that, yeah, we're going to have an e-learning course and RISE could be the authoring tool, Articulate RISE. So then we would actually just... Um, instead of having a, a storyboard saying, well, this is what it will look like, I'd actually design it and develop it just a little mini module of it and rise for our particular SMEs at Allstate. They just didn't have the time to look at it and look at a Word doc and, and then meet again to see the next version of it, the iteration of it. So build it just a little mini and rise and show them and um, walk them through it. But similar to what Joni and Shantae had said, I found that my number one takeaway with the corporate world, and I'm sure everywhere, it's not just corporate, but SMEs, you're never going to look at a SMEs resume and say SME there that that's not their role. So they've probably been voluntold was what I found out that they'd get on the phone with me and they're like, okay, like they'd have this whole idea of what they're gonna walk us through or, or what have you and just, they just thought it was more of them sitting back and watching us work. So they didn't really know that what their purpose was. So I found that that was a huge takeaway with me in corporate world is to sit down, have a one-on-one -on -one with this me and walk them through and set expectations of this is what I'm looking for from you. I'm not the content expert you are. You can feed me the content and we'll work together on the script and we'll make something pretty out of it. So. But yeah, very, I think the biggest takeaway was like extremely fast paced and working through Addy. Yes, it, you are working through it, but there could be, not to diss it by any means, but there could be some little shortcuts. Maybe it's not the full entire Addy. It's got to be a bit more agile than that with such tight deadlines. Yeah. yeah, and that's another good call out to Darlene that I, that I just want to stop and, and pause on. So again, it's like we're... We're learning all the best practices, but best practices collide with real world and real yeah. world timelines. And so sometimes we will, you know, trim up some of those steps or we will skip them, you know, and, you know, in some cases, you know, even after you, or once you get to a point that you have built so many trainings, like some of those foundational pieces that you do in the analysis phase, you may skip them all together, right? So things things get altered through your experience and then how much time you're actually given to complete a project because it's not uncommon that somebody's like oh it's only an hour training you can build that in a day right oh, yeah. yeah that that's a very common problem that will happen happen in the in the training and development space whenever you're working with people that don't quite understand like what it takes to build a quality learning solution so then it might be somebody's boss or somebody on the leadership team says, oh yeah, Darlene can knock that out by next Friday. And then Darlene gets a project. She's like, yeah, I need six weeks. Sorry, you've got until next week, right? So yeah. there are definitely gonna be some things that are skip, you know, skimped on in order to, to really meet that deadline. So yep. thank you for highlighting that. All right, Sarah, tell us about the day in the life of a freelance instructional designer. So what I uh, love about freelance work versus uh, being a teacher is that 
the structure of my day is what I want it to be. Um, if, but also if I don't put a structure into place, then there is no structure. So um, I have to uh, either start the day or end the day with a to-do list. I have physical planners that I get every month so I can uh, prioritize what I need to do. I'm usually working on multiple projects at a time. So I have to look at the timelines and figure out what needs my attention first thing in the morning. Um, I also have to keep in mind the time zones of the clients that I'm working with. First thing in the morning, if I have something that I need uh, to deliver later in the day, I can sometimes push a project to first thing in the morning my time because on the West Coast, uh, they're you know they're going to be in bed for four hours by the time I've by the time I've uh, gotten a project done. So lots of prioritizing. Um, I for one of my roles, I'm leading a team of instructional designers, so I always have to kind of figure out where are the people that I'm leading, where are they at, and what do they need from me? Because I know when I was on the other end and there was somebody that I was waiting on materials from, that stops my day if I like I can't move forward with the project if I don't have what I need from them. So I like to make sure that I send off whatever source files um, my other instructional designers or graphic designers, whoever I'm working with, whatever they need, so that they can move forward. In their projects um, and then it really just depends on the project i dive into storyboards um, i dive into uh, e-learning development using articulate um, depending on the project lots of writing um, and lots of working right now it's lots of working in uh storyline this week <laughs> Awesome. Uh, but then because I'm freelance, sometimes part of my day is that I get to go and pick up my daughter from school because I, you know, but uh, sometimes I stay up until, you know, midnight working because I pick my daughter up from school. Right. So mm -hmm. uh, there's lots of balancing. But the, what's nice is that I get to largely I get to decide. So true. That is something very beautiful about being in business for yourself is how much flexibility you have in your schedule. It's a super nice perk. All right, Katie, tell us about a day in the life for you. <laughs> oh, I, it's nice to hear everybody's. I feel like that there's a lot of what I do in all three of those currently. Um, the bulk of my experience was in a corporate world, and I will kind of ditto what Darlene said. It's fast paced and also maybe fast changing in terms of um, what maybe your expectations are in terms of a project, a project scope. Um, I'll say that sometimes in corporate, depending on your leadership or depending on the organization in general, sometimes the scope can really be fluid sometimes, which just can be frustrating, but it also can be nice to move things along quickly, like just kind of um, be in a fast paced environment. That's what I liked about it, but also that things that did thing. have the tendency to change often. Um, so that could be your leader, uh, could be how you work. It could be how things get, um, push down. So it could be a lot of things that just change often. Um, and then having the flexibility now to kind of see all three working in higher ed or working in uh, is a, a kind of in a freelance sort of space. It's nice to have that flexibility as well. So um, I'll say that I kind of kind of ping pong and also support everything else that everybody said in that in their experience, which really is the same. Awesome. Awesome. Do you find certain instructional design positions are normally remote while others would be in person, like in corporate, is that more likely in person or remote? Who has some thoughts about this? I think it depends on the organization. Um, I think before it's kind of like a pre COVID post COVID sort of question sometimes. Pre-COVID, I think organizations wanted people to be in person. And then post-COVID, it's kind of like, oh, well, this can all be done in <laughs> remotely. So there's been a little bit more, I would say, open-mindedness to the idea of working remotely for more positions than we ever thought about. Um, but it really does depend on the, or on the organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Let's see what else that we have. Sounds like most of you transitioned to instructional design. Did you find imposter syndrome to be strong while transitioning? And did it get easier to trust your expertise as you move to the position? As a teacher, this seems like one of my biggest hurdles. So Joni, how about we start with you and we will work our way around. Okay. Well, um, you know, this is one that I think about all the time because when we're building courses and we are looking at the content as a teacher, you already know 
by writing these learning objectives that you've been writing forever, you you know how to do that. You know how to structure the, um, I want to call it outlining, but you know how that delivery should look. What should happen first at the beginning of the delivery of the content? What should happen next? You understand chunking and breaking things down for your students, right? All of that is the same thing that we were actually doing. Um, the biggest thing that I have found, though, as far as overcoming that imposter syndrome where you're thinking, oh, am I doing this right? Or, oh, am I really qualified for that? I'm really going to encourage you all to find what I call your instructional design tribe. Find people that you can discuss your imposter syndrome with. Say, look, I'm really this situation is happening or this is happening in my mind. What do you think? How, and maybe as someone who isn't really an instructional designer, but they know you already, they're just um, a support person that you have, maybe somebody on your reference list for your resume and run it by them how you're feeling. They're going to help you see a lot of the attributes that you have that you're not always seeing in yourself. And that really does help you overcome as well. Um, just finding those people, whether those people are on LinkedIn, whether those people are your Facebook friends, whether those people are who you're already working with, or other instructional designers from the Hangout. Who's Who do you see posting the most in this group or commenting the most? Reach out to them. Send them a, a, something in Messenger and say, hey, I noticed you commented on this. Um, I have a question or this is my situation and start building those relationships. Really, it's those relationships that are going to help you combat that imposter syndrome when you're feeling it. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Joni. All right, Katie, how about we, we go to you? Yeah, so that was a, I can definitely identify that coming from um, teaching. It just felt like everyone was going to be able to, was I was going to walk into my first day on the job and somebody was going to go, no, 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 get your purse. Like you need to get out of here. <laughs> this isn't the place for you. And we, we can see it. And I think in that first week, I r had a meeting uh, with leadership and I have said some point, and it was like this light bulb moment of this discussion of, we don't really know, like somebody should research that, or we should figure that out. And I think I was kind of like, oh, like nobody's, everybody's still figuring this out. It doesn't matter what position you're in. Um, nobody want, Nobody's looking for you to be the outsider. And also everybody's still figuring it out. And um, I think that was a way for me to go, oh, wait, <laughs> I'm in just the same place as everyone else. I have good expertise and to build confidence in that. And the power of saying, I don't really know, I'll figure it out. Um, and that's okay too. And no one is going to say like, Ugh, you should get out of here. Um, nobody's sure. saying that, um, but we feel like they might. We feel like they will, that everyone's an expert and they're willing to say that about themselves and not about us. And um, it's just not the case. Um, and it wasn't my experience. And it always, uh, looking back, I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I had just as much experience as anyone else. It might've been different, but it's just the same level and it's the same importance when it came to that job. So. Mm -hmm. I just say to remember that. Awesome. Thank you. All right. How about you, darling? Do you get imposter syndrome? Uh, yeah, every day. <laughs> I found that I have two moments in my life where as an instructional designer that really stand out for me with imposter syndrome. One was when I was early into the role at Allstate and maybe a year in, give or take. And I found that, um, because of my expertise and the location that I'm in, I'm in Edmonton, Alberta in Canada. So I was like their Alberta champion for insurance and insurance in Alberta is very different for auto insurance versus our other provinces. So I was always pulled into the huge projects that were Alberta related because of my experience, my background and et cetera. So meanwhile, the other IDs on my team, they were actually doing a huge volume of e learnings and videos and job aids. And meanwhile, I'm sitting on like this boring old auto insurance from hell. Like, can I say that? But it was. <laughs> of and, and I'm going, whoa, like they're creating all this stuff. Like, look at all they're creating. And meanwhile, I'm bogged down into this 20 module 
exercise or e-learning that was crazy and how fun can you make it when it's compliance like yeah you can have some fun with it and stuff but this is important stuff so I found how I stepped out of that is exactly what Joni had said, like relying on my colleagues, chatting with them, um, bending their ear, finding out from them like, hey, what could we do to make this fun? Like adding some gamification, kind of pulling from them what they were doing and copying, pasting into, into my world. So it really helped me learn by watching others and recognizing even if it is compliance, it can still be fun. Like, why are we making it so ultra boring? because what's the end result? What do you want your learner to take away from this? And if it's so dry and so awful, they're going to find it as awful to complete it as you are building it. So that was kind of my takeaway. And I think my second moment of big time imposter syndrome was when I lost my job at Allstate. I was completely lost being there for years and thinking I'm not good enough. And wow, that's why the job was eliminated. The good news of the bad news is, is that the whole entire role was eliminated across the country. So it, it wasn't just me. So I had to recognize that. And I really drew on even social media and stuff and my Allstate friends reaching out to me and saying, Darlene, like you are good enough. You're very good at what you do. So hanging on to that, like having almost, even when I was at Allstate and still to this day, I, as silly as it sounds, I actually have like a folder on my laptop on my desktop of recognition. And if you're feeling really low or it's a tough day, you can go into that. You can look at those emails. Those also start to become like your references and stuff if you're job searching and etc. So just drawing on that and recognizing that you are good enough and you can get through this. And there's others like this one ID that I looked up to at Allstate. She was incredible. I'm just like, how can you be so good every day? And she's like, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. I'm just faking it. I'm just going in there and I'm just doing my stuff. And I'm like, wow, like, you had me fooled. I thought you knew what you were doing. So that's also what it comes down to too. Yeah. That's awesome. I love, I love the folder with, with the positive, with the positive things in there. That's awesome. awesome. Thank you. All right, Sarah. Besides what everyone else has said, I don't know what it is about teachers. We are, I feel like we're just made to feel like we're not the experts or like we're, we have to be teachers forever. Um, as soon as I, uh, worked with somebody outside of teaching, the, my first interaction, I felt treated like, uh, they treated me as more of a professional. And I was like, well, why like why don't we get this in teaching? Um, but I think besides what everyone else has said, the best thing that you can do to get over it, because you are gonna feel it, um, is just to do the work and get the feedback. And you'll, as soon as you pass on you know, your storyboard or your course to whoever needs to look at it, you're going to be reassured. I will never forget the first time I passed on some learning objectives. All I did was rework learning objectives. I literally wrote five sentences based on content. And the person that I sent it up to was like, oh my gosh, you killed it. Like this, you, you totally killed it. And I was like, whoa, like I did this in five minutes. This was, yeah. I do this every day. Um, but just like that feedback really helps validate you. That's awesome. That's awesome. I agree. Well, I'll answer the question too. So I've been in education for about 20 years. I've worn all kinds of different hats as an educator, classroom teacher, training facilitator, LMS administrator, e-learning developer, instructional designer, you know, training and development marketing team, like all of it. And I'll have to tell you, in every single one of those roles, I was like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. You know, like I had imposter syndrome in every single one of them. And I was in a virtual conference last year with ATD, and one of the speakers was talking about imposter syndrome. And I believe they were at a VP level, something like that. And they were talking about even at their level, they are still getting imposter syndrome. And something that he said really stood out to me. He's like, everybody gets imposter syndrome. And that is normal because you experience discomfort when you're in a period of growth. And so we're in a period of growth. We're being stretched. So we have, we're not comfortable in that. And what he said was the ones that you have to worry about are the ones who don't have imposter syndrome. Like they don't have that awareness to know, you know, like they don't know what they're doing. 
at least the rest of us, we question that we don't know what we're doing, which means that we also want to grow and learn more so that we can do better. So it's totally normal. One thing I typically say to anyone that's coming on to a new job is like, really, you need to be in that job for at least one year, like go through all the cycles, the ebbs and the flows and have all the different curveballs thrown at you to you really, that's when you really get your sea legs is like once you've done it for about a year. And then as other things come up, you've got foundation to build on like, oh yeah, we something similar happened with X. So you don't have that discomfort. Totally normal, totally normal to have that experience. It does go away. But yep. sadly, it comes back when something new comes into your life. So you're going to you're going to face imposter syndrome as long as you are in your career and growing and changing. Every time someone asks you to do something new, like, oh, what? I've never created a video. You want animated video? OK, I don't know what I'm doing. Right. So it's totally normal. What does the hourly work week load look like for all of you? So just an average, like how many hours a week are you working? Sarah, let's start with you. Um, I, now I'm working about 40 hours a week, but it can change. Um, and that's again, mostly up to me if I want to drop, uh, uh, drop a project or maybe not uh, put myself towards a project. I can work less, um, you can plan to work less, plan to work more. Um, but I can be 40 hours if I want to. Awesome. Thank you. Katie. Yep. Same. Um, I think 40 hours is a good, um, number just to put on it to keep a good schedule and a structure uh, to your week. But there's a lot of flexibility, especially if you're working uh, freelance or um, in a place where you can take on just different projects. But you can it changes with the week. So if you've got a heavy project or a heavy sprint cycle or week like that could be more and it could be less in another time whenever maybe you're in between some things to move forward. So I think 40 is probably a good average number, um, but it could go up or down based on on whatever you're working on. Awesome. Yeah. Darling. Oh, sorry. I was clicking on the wrong button. Um, yeah, I think 40 hours definitely is about the average for me too. I do remember in my Allstate years though, I was like the bad girl and I would, it would be nothing for me to work like 50 hours plus and you're just not doing yourself any favors. Sometimes there are those deadlines where it's necessary, but I'm here to say that never once did they ever ask me to work it. I was just doing it because I felt that I needed to, to get things rolled off or what have you. So yeah. I think the 40 hours is a good a good work-life balance at least. Yeah. And I'll say in a corporate environment as well, um, you can usually start to tell when that is turning into a toxic environment is when they're yeah. asking and really pushing you to work more than that or yeah. the projects start to feel like it's more than the 50, 60, without it being your choice or without it being something that you want to do. So, um, and sometimes it will start to feel like that at certain organizations. So that's kind of a red flag for me. If I, if I get the pressure past that point, um, then that means that like, what what's what's else is happening here? Mm -hmm. That might be rough. Yeah. And if yeah. I could just add to that too, I found that on the weeks that I was working more, the reason why was because I had so many projects that I was mentioning, fast paced, et cetera, so many projects on the go at one time that it was nothing for me to have like 15, 20 meetings in a week. So at an hour, averaging an hour each, some of them yeah. more, some of them two, three hours because they're project team meetings and you're going through everything piecemeal. It's um, then I felt that I needed to, but never once again, I don't want to give that impression that they were asking me to do more. I was just doing more. And I really, really noticed it when I stepped out of that, that I was exhausted. So <laughs> don't do what I do. <laughs> Thank you, darling. All right, Joni, how about you? Well, I think my situation's a little bit different right now because I would say that I'm working part time. Um, I only have a few separate contracts that I'm working on right now. And ideally, they don't take a ton of my time. So I'm able to um, maybe work three to five hours a week on each one. And that includes the half hour that I meet with each of the SMEs each week. So, but when those add up, that still can get to a lot of work. And I find myself um, not just 
doing the work that's within the course that I'm or the contract that I'm working on, but I'm doing a little bit of research. Or once I've met with the SME, I'm taking that time to analyze what we talked about. And then I'm taking that the extra time to go in and, and double check what we've accomplished and what we still need to do. So I think for me, the project management piece um, is and keeping everything going within our timeline is what takes the most time for me right now, double checking the, the work and make sure all of our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed, that kind of stuff. Um, but in my other position that I used to have, yes, it was 40 hours a week. And one of the things that I really had to do, and Sarah mentioned this before, is especially when you're working remote, you have to put yourself put yourself on your own schedule which means, you know, if you're going to have any exercise time in your life, find out what time of day that you're going to do that, make sure you do it during that time, and then schedule out when your meetings are, when you're going to be in, sitting in front of that computer, and give yourself a routine, something that's not going to, you're not going to deviate from too much, otherwise you might find yourself a little bit scattered. So for me example, I work out every morning, and I'm usually in front of the computer if not by 8.30, by 9 o'clock, and sometimes I'm sitting here till 6.30 at night, but if I want to go to lunch, I can. And if I need to run to the grocery yeah. store, I can. So those, you know, it, that flexibility helps out as well. But it's still probably a good 30 or 40 hours, even though I'm kind of part-time, I'm still putting in a lot of hours. Awesome. Yes, and I will say that's the best part from teaching. It was like, so I can go to the bathroom like anytime I want to. Right? <laughs> Like it. doctor appointments. Yeah. It was like, right. what? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. So we are at time, but before we close off, I would just like to go around and have you all share some of your favorite resources and any piece of advice that you would have for an aspiring instructional designer who wants to cross over into instructional design. Katie, you want to kick us off favorite resources and best piece of advice? Yes. So my favorite resources um, that I went to as a, in the corporate world and even today is Envato Elements. So many great templates, um, stock images, um, anything really. Uh, Canva, building anything very quick, very easy. Um, and then also being able to use ATD as a great resource. ATD has um, it's an association of talent development. So webinars, articles, what are other institutions um, doing? What are other organizations doing to draw some inspiration and kind of compare that even with the evaluation piece, which is so important in the corporate world is to evaluate what you're doing or to be able to present some sort of ROI. So all those things become very important. And ATD was a great, great thing for you in that. And the best piece of advice I would say is from uh, Frozen 2, which is uh, to just do the next right thing. So um, take that step, do it. Um, if this is something that feels right to you and you just don't know the steps in between, like just do the next right thing, um, the next right step to take, and it will it will kind of start to form from there. So that would be my, my best advice. All right. Thank you, Katie. How about you, Sarah? Not a whole lot. <laughs> um, so my favorite resources, um, the Articulate community has a lot of free resources, even if you're not a subscriber, um, blogs, if you're looking on information about instructional design or trends and e-learning. And then also they have a community where if I've ever had a question about anything on Storyline or Rise, all I have to do is search it. And somebody has asked the question in their community and uh, a, a support person from Articulate will answer. Um, I've never utilized this myself, but if you have a problem that you can't find in the community, you can send them your project and somebody from Articulate will um, like look at it and help you figure it out. So I've gone to that a lot of uh, time and time again. They also have webinars. Um, some of them I think you can view if you don't subscribe, but I've uh, watched their webinars on using Rise and using Storyline before. Um, and then for uh, tools that I use uh, to create courses, Audacity is a free audio editor and I've never found something that I couldn't do and I just audacity um, for free. So I think it's a great tool. Um, and then my favorite paid tool is if you're going to invest in something, snag it. I use every day um, for screen captures, video recording. You can use it to create job aids. 
Um, and then my best piece of advice, especially for freelance, is to just say yes to opportunities and um, put yourself out there. And uh, if you have an opportunity, take it. Uh, even at first, you feel like you're not going to get paid enough or uh, maybe it'll take a little bit of time. If you have the bandwidth, I would say put yourself out there, even if you're feeling like you like an imposter um, and say yes at first, because you'll get to a point where you can be picky and you'll make enough money. Um, but saying yes has gotten me pretty far so far. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Darlene? Um, for my couple of tools, I'd say the training magazine. They have a ton of free webinars from everything from um, articulate tips to PowerPoint. Um, sometimes it's not even on an actual authoring tool. The other day I watched one, actually just yesterday I think it was, on um, accessibility and they did it was specific to storyline but it could be anything they give a lot of tips and tricks uh, one of the tools that they actually shared was a free screen reader download it was an nv access and it's all free and tons of people were commenting it's great i love it i use it all the time so it will actually make it really user friendly for you once you've completed and designed your course you've developed it it's ready to go before it's implemented live you want to make sure it's accessible you can actually run your course through it so so that was really cool um, and I think as far as my advice goes is just continue to connect with others in LinkedIn I read something the other day that was so true it's not like Facebook like Facebook you kind of cringe and you're like no like I'm not going to connect with that person but LinkedIn it's professional there's never been someone that's reached out to me that I haven't connected with so I find that um, that was their piece of advice in LinkedIn is do you or do you not connect with people? And even if they're not instructional designers, it could be somebody else that's in education, in corporate, in freelance, in a different area that really helps you become who you want to be um, and connect with as many ideas as possible too. And don't be afraid to ask questions like Joni had asked, had mentioned earlier, like if you, if you want to link out to someone and ask them like, hey, how did you do that? Or what did you feel about that? So I think that that's really, really helped me grow and continue to learn the different, um, some of the different tools and such out there and be comfortable with them. Awesome. Thank you so much, Darlene. Joni? Well, I have a bunch of different resources that I love. I'm going to piggyback a little bit on what Katie said. If if you have the opportunity to do a paid for um, either Envato Elements or Canva Pro, do it because both of them have audio and they have video and they have images that you're going to be able to use in almost any type of content that you're building. Um, for example, if you are working in Canva Pro and you have one of their videos that has music with it, my fa one of my favorite tools is Adobe Premiere Pro. If you can up, you can export it from Canva and then put it into import it into um, Premiere Pro. And when you do that, you can you can take the um, video and, and the audio and separate it and then edit it and do so much with that audio or video. I mean, it's just amazingly fun. So I'm finding that Adobe um, Premiere Pro is kind of addicting for me. Another little thing that I love, and um, I found a new podcast. So I wanted to share this. It is Learning Trends Beyond the Buzz. And it's really about all of the new, all the up and coming different types of trends that we're doing with content building and e-learning experiences for um, all of our consumers. And I tell you what, there are some great people that they're interviewing. They're giving resources there as well. And what I found is that through podcasting, you can communicate so many different different types of information. So I decided that I was going to try that myself. And this past year, I've done a couple of interviews and I've thrown them into Adobe Premiere Pro and edited the audio. It's so much fun, y'all. Um, the other thing that I'm loving right now is Storyline. So if you have not tried Storyline yet, you can get a free trial. And you don't have to pay for it right away. But go in and play with it if you haven't had the opportunity because it's very similar to PowerPoint. And you're going to find that you're going to be able to build these interactive learning experiences for your 
learners or your participants so quickly if you're already familiar with PowerPoint. So those are some of my favorite tools and um, resources that I like to work with. And I have a piece of advice. Actually, I think I have two. For those of you transitioning from teaching possibly into instructional design and you're worried about your resume and worried about whether or not you have all of the skills and know all those programs and all the tech features that are on all of these job descriptions, do this. Go through LinkedIn or whatever job um, resource that you're looking at that you, and put in instructional design. Find those jobs that you think would be a fit for you. And even if you don't apply, look at all the, the skills that they're asking you to have, or all, whether it's um, not just communication, but look at, look at like the programs. Do they want you to know different theories? And start a list. So I have a draft resume, and that's what I call it, where I have listed out all of the different programs that I don't know yet, but I've seen them requested on different job roles. So I've listed them out and on my draft, I have them in gray. So as soon as I learn it, then, and I, I can say, yeah, I could talk about this in an interview. If someone gave me a project and said, Joni, go and build with this program, I could, I could do that now. I understand it enough. Then I change from gray to black and I put it in my real resume. I'm ready to go. So that's one piece of advice. And then I'm gonna go back and also say this again build your relationships make those connections find your id tribe because that's really what's going to connect you to everyone else in this field if they're going to give you support and if you're working remote you're home alone a lot you want to have someone to chat with really quick if you have a question yeah. and when you have that tribe you have that connection yeah. awesome such great advice from everyone here so thank you so much for sharing and I just want to say thank you for making the time again and the space for being here today. So thank you to each one of you. We'll see you next time. Go out and be awesome. Bye. Bye.